Okay, Charlie has asked me to give you an idea of what Stockton was like be just before the Civil War. And I've used the, 19, the 1860 census to get a lot of information about the town. We were a part of Prospect until 1857. So the 1860 census is the first where Stockton appears all on its own. The break between Stockton and Prospect was mainly due to politics. South Prospect, or Stockton, was moving towards the Republican Party that was new at that time. And there was a strong leaning towards both anti-slavery and temperance. The 1860 census tells us that the population at that time was 1,595 people. Wow. 822 of them were male, and 773 were female in 294 households. The age range that year was one month to 91 years. There were altogether 40 pages in the population schedule for that year, and 22 of those pages have at least one person below the age of one, and 21 pages with at least one person over the age of 70. 65% of the males, or 509, were working. 17% or 135 of the females were working for pay. There were 19, less than 1%, who were teachers. And they were both male teachers and female teachers. For the men, the three largest categories of jobs were mariners and master mariners, who were able to be captains, combined 201 men. Farmers and farm laborers were 156. Carpenters, ship, house, finish, and master carpenters, 55. So a big drop. For females, the two largest categories were servants, 86, and seamstresses, 21. Most of the women who were working for pay were either young single women or widows. Young single men were mainly mariners or farm laborers. The 1860 industrial schedule included only businesses with employees that year. Other years, you didn't have to have an employee to be on that schedule. There were three sawmills in town, three shipyards, one boot and shoe shop, and one blacksmith shop that had employees that year. Shipbuilding in what is now Stockton started before 1800. And the last ship that was launched was in 1921, although there was quite a break between 1875 and the start of World War I. The top building years were in the 1850s and 1860s. And the years with the most vessels launched were as follows. Twelve vessels were launched in 1865. Eleven were launched in both 1866 and 1868. Ten were launched in both 1867 and 1853. And nine were launched in 1854 and 1855. The census recorded the value of the vessels that were built in all three shipyards in 1859 is $91,000. 1,520 tons of oak timber were used, 480 tons of other timber, and 107 tons of iron. And the three shipyards together had 102 employees. The blacksmith on the industry schedule used 10 tons of iron, 10 tons of coal, 150 pounds of steel and employed two people. 
The jobs given on the census show that the town was supplied with most occupations that were needed to provide for the necessities of life. Innkeeper, merchants, stone cutters, clergymen, light tender, fisherman, millman, physician, wheelwright, plus all the jobs that were needed to build ships. This is the world in which the young men of Stockton who served in the Civil War grew up in. Orpheus Roberts, the young man Charlie will talk about, was the oldest child of Sylvanus and Mary Jane Roberts of North Stockton. Two of his brothers also served in the Civil War. Only one of them survived. Sylvanus Irish Roberts, who usually signed his name just S.I. Roberts, was born in Brooks, Maine. His parents and two old, older brothers moved to Ohio, but Sylvanus was left with relatives in Maine. In his teens, he went to Ohio to join his family, but soon returned to Maine. A prospect girl, Mary Jane Thompson, soon caught his eye. At that time, Searsport and Stockton were still part of Prospect. He bought land in North Stockton and married Mary Jane. The land had a stream running through it, and he dammed it and built a sawmill. He's supposed to have used the sawmill to mill the lumber for building his house and barn. He first appears in the Prospect Census in 1840 with his wife, two sons, and two daughters. In later censuses, he's recorded either as a farmer or a millman, and he can be found on both industrial and agricultural schedules of the U.S. Census. He also built and operated a store on one side of the stream. S.I. became a member of the temperance movement. He served as county sheriff in 1855 and served several times as a select man. He became a justice of the peace and he was known for his willingness to provide charity to the needy and for his friendliness. Locals called him Uncle Sill. When a schoolhouse was built near his store, it was called the Roberts School in honor of Uncle Sill. After the death of his first wife, he remarried a widow who was also a cousin, and he had four children by each wife. Through the years, he bought and sold many pieces of land in several different towns, and he eventually had two sawmills on the stream. In 1850, S.I. had real estate valued at $1,425. In 1860, his real estate was valued at $4,000 and personal estate at $5,697. In 1870, his real estate was valued at $3,000 and his personal estate at $6,000. Two of his sons also had real estate at that time, valued at $1,300. Orpheus was brought up in a household that valued temperance, service to town, and hard work. The latter is demonstrated by his father's mills, farm, and store all operating at the same time. The 1860 U.S. Census shows how well his farm was doing. There were 100 acres of improved land. He had one horse, four milk cows, four oxen, five other cattle, 10 sheep, and one swine. He harvested 10 bushels of Indian corn, 30 bushels of oats, 14 bushels of barley, 9 bushels of peas or beans, 40 bushels of potatoes, 400 pounds of butter were made during the year, 30 tons of hay were cut, and 50 pounds of wool was shorn from the sheep. He also had an orchard and a market garden. 
So he was really one of the very wealthy and prominent men in town at that time. The Grays of North Stockton were neighbors of the Roberts family, and they also sent several sons to fight in the Civil War, with only one of those sons returning. The Roberts district lost a large percentage of their young men during the Civil War. Orpheus was just one of them. And Charlie is going to tell you about Orpheus. Thank you, Kathy. Very lucky I got my foot in all three outfits that are here tonight. First of all, thanks to my Legion post, Commander Seekins, Ernie, helped set the thing up, but thanks for your hospitality. Thank you, Kathy, for uh, laying the table for us and what it was like in 1860. I joined the SUVCW quite a while ago, three, four years. The darndest thing, I joined in Bangor but had to take meetings in Dover Foxcroft. And then I went back to Bangor and I got run out of the hospital meeting room because of COVID. So I ended up in Lincoln and, and then they kicked me out and sent me to Rockport to join this new camp. So I think I finally found a home. And at the outset, we decided two things, uh, different, a little bit different. One is that the meetings would travel, as Steve said, uh, and go to towns in our service area. But the other is that a significant portion of the meetings would be used for education, for talking about the Civil War and the people that fought in it. And I was looking for just that. It used to be Richardson's Round Table a group of uh, devoted Civil War study people uh, that met here in Waldo County. Anybody who knew Ray Webb, uh, Carl Robbins, these, these gentlemen and many more would get together and share what discoveries they would found in their research over the last month. And they folded now. When uh, Glenn Webb died, uh, some months ago, they shut it down. I started the Civil War interest. Uh, one day I was reading my grandmother's book, The Story of Stockton Springs. And in it, she lists 101 Civil War soldiers. And what a clinical list that is, unless you do some digging. Uh, and, and once you do some digging, you find this some fascinating things. Uh, you know, she married into the Ellis family and she's got one of her husband, my grandfather's uh, uncles, uh, listed twice. First name, middle name, middle name, first name. And that, that happened a lot in the Civil War. I was uh, attracted to the SUVCW after trying to find one of the Griffins on the list, and I couldn't. And somebody said, you ought to look on SUVCW database, and they, they're attempting to put every Civil War soldier into their own database, and there tell the story about these men and what unit they were with, uh, date of birth, date of death, the usual things. So I tried his name in there, and bingo, he's buried in Portland. But I, I made it a goal to find the burial place of all 101 men and figured, you know, I'd take a few weekends, spare time over the next few weekends, and be done with it. That was five years ago. That's, that's a big rabbit hole. <laughs> I have found people buried in Port Townsend, Oregon, after three full man days of searching, and it wasn't even me that searched. Any of you look on our Facebook, C. Lee Burton found that one for me. Um, I found uh, Mr. Finney, who I, I thought 
had to have been from away and just given to the draft quota of Stockton. That there's a thing they used to do. I figured he was from away and filling a draft quota. Well, it turns out he was related to somebody here. Um, and I knew that he belonged here because I found him in the Masonic Minutes. They had a regularly scheduled meeting and he went and they raised him, or they brought him in the first degree. They had a special meeting two weeks later and, and uh, raised him to second degree and he became a master at the next stated regular meeting uh, a month after he first became a Mason. Two days later, he's sworn in, mustered in, and he's off to the war. So I got a clue now that he belonged here. Later on, in my gravestone work, I found his father's stone buried 18 inches under the earth. It was brought back up, and today, we know where the Finneys are buried, and it turns out they're related to me. <laughs> so I'm still looking for many of those 101 uh, people. What was the Civil War about? I'm not going to go into that in deep, deep detail, but if I ask every one of these people who are in SUVCW, what was, the, what was the real reason for the fight? You might get all different answers. My answer is simple, slavery. It was all about slavery. The South did not want to give up the one economic advantage they had. 40% of the South were not white people. They were enslaved working for the other 60%, or at least that handful of plantation owners. And a couple key dates to keep in mind. Abraham Lincoln came up with the Emancipation Proclamation and it was effective January 1st, 1863. Exactly six months later is the Battle of Gettysburg. Six months and one day later, Orpheus Roberts is killed. <clears throat> and I, I didn't realize myself that the Emancipation Proclamation didn't make free and citizens anybody who was black. What it said was all enslaved people in the states currently in rebellion against the Union shall be then, thenceforward and forever free. So if you belong, if you were a slave in Maryland, tough luck, because they were not in rebellion against the Union. If you were a slave in Maine, and I guess there were a few, tough luck. Nonetheless, the, the fight was about slavery. So, the end of May, uh, let, let me, let's do the 4th Maine real quick. Orpheus Roberts joined the 4th Maine Infantry Regiment. The regiment's 1,200, 1,500 people. Am I right? And he was in Company I. He joined... To, to me, fascinating. He joined from North Stockton uh, this Company I that was being formed in Rockland, and indeed it was called the Rockland Regiment. Uh, it was famous, uh, made famous later. Uh, it was put together in part by Hiram Barry. Hiram Barry uh, worked his way through the ranks and was made, uh, help me out here, Brigadier General and was the highest ranking soldier killed in the Civil War. And he's buried in Rockland. Beautiful uh, statue made in his likeness on a tall pedestal. 
the Italian carver who did that work, when they brought that statue into Rockland by barge and transported it to the uh, cemetery and lifted it by whatever uh, crane they were using, turned its back all the time that was going on because he couldn't stand to see it if it was dropped. <laughs> so Orpheus, Orpheus is not the only one that joined the fourth main. He had neighbor kids, neighbor young men, grown up with all his life, North Stockton, couple properties, adjacent properties, Kathy? Yes. Um, we had uh, Orpheus Roberts and his brother Edwin joined the 4th Maine. Uh, and then Major, eventually Major Robert Gray, his brother Clarendon Gray, his brother Sewell Gray, uh, and later, in a different outfit, a brother Augustus Gray. The Gray family sent four boys to war, three in one day, with Orpheus. Only one of them came home. They're all buried in unmarked graves. Orpheus is buried in an unmarked grave. His brother, probably buried at sea, died on a gunboat. North Stockton took it hard. It's been kind of an adventure, too, because we had a town clerk that was a town clerk since the dinosaur days, and he's long gone now. It was my pleasure to have known Walt Trundy. I didn't pay a day. He was a town clerk, and you go to his house to get a fishing license. You better be buying it the day before you want to go fishing because you couldn't get out of there. He wanted to tell you all about history, and I didn't care. It's too bad. Uh, but there were people who paid attention to it. One of the things he wrote down was is a little burial ground on Green Valley Road that the town marked out uh, as a burial spot or a cemetery that has no gravestones. And, and Walt, from what he had heard, said he thought some of the gray boys were buried there. And the cemetery committee in Stockton, which I had, and the historical society people have all dug into that, and I even had a restoration couple, experts, that are experts at primitive burials, look things over. But most important, we know that the Gray boys, Robert Gray, who became a major, was a, a man who kept a diary. And his diary is at one of the universities now. And in that diary, it tells about, today we buried Maddie, which is Sewell, a nickname for Sewell. And later on, the man with the diary, Major Robert, uh, ended up being wounded at the Battle of Wilderness. And as they were, he was on an ambulance. And when he got to Fredericksburg, he died, and they went into the city cemetery and buried him. A friend of his went back a week or two later to check on the grave, and he had been disinterred by the locals. And when they were asked, the folks from around the cemetery asked about it, they said they didn't want any damn Yankees buried there, and they wouldn't tell them where they put the body. There's still people in the South. I was down there, uh, stationed there in 1970-71, and there's still people down there who don't know that damn Yankees, two different words. <laughs> so the Rockland Regiment uh, had a hard start. They were told that they were signing up for three months. They went to sign up to be sworn in, 
and uh, Walt, uh, Hiram Barry uh, informed them that the rules had changed and they were there for three years. And he asked for anybody who just couldn't abide by that and only two of them left. Everybody else signed in for the three year duration. It included three gray boys, Orpheus and his brother, and Oscar Colson, who survived, buried in North Carolina, Almond Dickey, who survived, he's buried in the big cemetery in Belfast, Samuel Eames, who's at the, uh, didn't survive, he died of disease, he's at Alexandria, Alexandria National Cemetery. And that's, there was uh, also a prospect soldier that signed up that same day. So we had nine from Stockton, one from Prospect, the two towns almost inseparable. But let, let's talk about what happened to Old Orpheus. The 4th Maine was returning from a fight that they had in Chancellorville where Hi Hiram Berry was shot and died. Uh, it, it was several weeks between Chancellorville and Gettysburg, but they were traveling on foot. And there was no particular battle or destination at the time, except they knew they were kind of following the Rebs. Uh, a couple days before Gettysburg broke out, they were able to get a day's rest from a long march. And on July 1st, they were 10 miles from Gettysburg. Again, up until that moment, nothing had happened. But fighting broke out on July 1st, 1863. The 4th Maine was 10 miles away. They were told to grab their gear and they made a quick march to Gettysburg in order to join the fight. Well, everything died down that day. It wasn't until the second that all hell broke loose. These, this company, this regiment rather, was sent to the foot of little, the famous Little Round Top, the Round Top that Joshua Chamberlain was holding on the extreme left of the army, and the later he did a bayonet charge down the hill because they were out of ammo. Well, these, the 4th Maine, and the 4th Maine was at the foot of this uh, area at what's called the Devil's Den. And it's also in the area of what got to be called the Slaughter Pen. And what was happening to them, uh, the fight is going on near the Devil's Den. There's artillery that they don't want the Confederates to, to get. Their job is to keep the Confederates from getting that artillery. But in the process, they're going to have to clean out this enormous rock formation that has all these Confederates in it that are threatening the artillery, the movement of troops. They're impeding Joshua Chamberlain from his day with destiny, which is credited with turning the Civil War. Orpheus Roberts is one of the, he had been enlisted, but they found value in his thinking and abilities, and they had done a field promotion to second lieutenant and they sent he and his men, and I believe even his brother, uh, I'm sorry, not his brother, the Gray boys that I mentioned earlier, they sent one of them in to the Devil's Den, clean out that nest of people. Now, getting there and, and being there to fight, they're up against two Alabama units the 44th and 48th Alabama. In the process of everything that they were doing, add to that the, the uh, 1st Texas Regiment, 
15th, 17th, and 20th Georgia. In other words, their opponents kept rolling in, and, and the 4th Maine at this point is getting to be decimated. In the process of trying to hold the dead, which they eventually lost, but it went back and forth several times, Orpheus was killed outright. So many times I've done research, and I know you have, how it is, where somebody is wounded and dies 36 days later of the wound. He was killed, killed outright. I don't know what the wound was. I don't know if it was cannon or rifle, but it was quick. Now what has happened, find a grave is a place we often go to, to to find out where somebody's buried and he has no gravestone so he's not on, he wasn't on find a grave. C. Lee Burton, our friend in North Carolina who's a, a descendant of the local family, Staples family, uh, has done all kinds of research. When he ran across Orpheus, we talked and I said it's known from Robert Gray's diary that they recovered Orpheus' body and took it up on Culp's Hill nearby and buried it. That's written. And later on there was a commission, months later, after the battle, the commission uh, hired people to go through that battlefield, and they were a long time doing this, recover everybody they could, and lay them out in what we now know as the Gettysburg National Cemetery. <laughs> Excuse me. Orpheus was not one of the people identified when they recovered his body, if they recovered it. There's a pretty good chance they did recover it. In speaking with Dave, Dave Sulin of Rockport, he's done a lot of research into how the graves and grave registration was handled. And he said that if they would have been able to tell from his uniform, the buttons on his uniform, that this body belonged to a main man. But that might be all they could tell. And so it is presumed that he is buried where it says, I think it's 104 unknown Maine soldiers. And so C. Lee has made a finder grave page for him, Gettysburg Cemetery, and he's used a picture of the fourth Maine monument as his gravestone. Now what I want to do, this is, there were six boys from North Stockton who went into the fight and only one of them came home. Nine men went into the 4th Maine, not one of them was buried in Stockton. I mean, some came home, went off to North Carolina or the buried in Belfast, whatever. And I want to, uh, make a standard military two-by-one uh, gr uh, gray granite marker like all us veterans get when we go and document uh, the name, the dates, and where he died and how and put that on the family grave site in North Stockton, his father's barrack farther than several, several others are buried back there. So, talk about the Gray Boys real quick because they, they figure into this. Uh, I told you that Sewell, or Maddie, was buried. Uh, Maddie, 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 where'd you go? He was buried after the battle at Fredericksburg. Major Robert Gray shot at the wilderness, buried in Fredericksburg, disinterred and hidden. 
Augustus Gray would die in Washington, D.C. of disease, but there's no record of where they put him. Clarendon Gray is the one that made it. He came home and then ended up going to the Boston area and worked for the Boston Police Department. He had to have had what we know today as PTSD because he, by the way, Clarendon's one of 24 men in that regiment to, earn, to be awarded the Kearney's Cross for valor. But he must have had PTSD. He made it as a cop for the longest, beat cop for the longest time. And one night he arrested somebody and he wanted him put in jail and the precinct wouldn't take the guy, didn't like the charges. So he started shopping precincts for this prisoner. <laughs> and when none of the precincts would put this guy away, he resigned. And his great-great-granddaughter, who has the Kearney Cross, said that the information the family has is he had to have had PTSD and couldn't, just couldn't take that anymore. Now, I brought with me uh, four books. Over in the front of this cemetery, in the very corner, is an upright gray monument. Uh, Joseph Plum Martin. He's a Revolutionary War soldier and wrote Private Yankee Doodle. And you're welcome to look at that book. I brought it with me. It's a reprint. We sell them at the Historical Society. His grandson was one of my 101 men, buried out in Albion. I brought the book about the 4th Maine called With Our Faces to the Foe, written by a man who taught school in the area, Peter Dal Dalton. A story of Stockton Springs, kind of where you go to get started on your research my grandmother's book, and then one that I stumbled on, what this cruel war was over. In other words, what caused this? And this woman, a graduate of uh, Mount Holyoke, heavily footnoted research and presentation, and the bottom line is, to her estimation, slavery and that, uh, that case has been made pretty well as far as I'm concerned. One last thing that's a bit aside, where the Legion is leaning on the uh, counter back there, I have flyers. On July 1st, there's a book coming out called Siege. And it tells about the true story of a coup that was attempted between Maine's governor and the leaders of a new political party. State House was under siege for several weeks by a Confederate force. This is after the war. I think there was also uh, artillery stolen from an armory. The occupation culminated in a showdown between armed rebels and Civil War hero General Joshua Chamberlain. And I'm promised it's a great read. My brother wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> so grandmother here, brother there. Uh, he has a few copies, but he, by contract, can't release them until July 1st. They'll be on sale uh, at our event at Fort Knox on July 16th. He'll be there signing away, signing his little heart out. <laughs> and I don't get anything for this. I asked him to come tonight just to say something about his book. He, he was busier than I am. 
And let me, let me just uh, review real quick. I think that's about it. Again, uh, there are 101 men. We've got, we got some really fascinating stories. Instead of concentrating just on Orpheus, we're not going to do all 101 men in July, but we've got the grandfather of Auntie M from the Wizard of Oz, buried on the Cape, uh, all Civil War soldiers, a Richardson that came home okay and became first mate of the Mary Celeste, the most famous ghost ship in history. They never found the crew after the ship was abandoned. We have a man who didn't serve, but bought a substitute, a Captain Pano, who saved the lives of countless Germans. I had not countless, somebody counted them. But he, uh, he went to sea off New York and found a Confederate ship had captured this ship that had principally had German people on board. And they were about to set fire to that ship without letting the people off. Pano surrendered his own ship, then wrote a bond promising to pay if they would let him take the Germans onto his ship. By the time he got back to New York, the sides of that ship were low in the water from all the weight. But by God, he saved all their lives. We've got fascinating people that have come out of this war in this town. None of them is famous as Hiram Barry, but in their own way, perhaps they are. So we're going to hit the highlights. Uh, instead of an hour of just having something to eat, I've got a great acoustical guitarist who's going to entertain us for an hour, six to seven, and then the presentation should be an hour, an hour and a half at most. Any questions at this point, particularly about Orpheus? Yes. Is it possible to do DNA testing on soldiers uh, from that long ago? I, I believe it is. One of, one of the things that my printer blurred when it printed out was how many people were involved though. We got 2.75 million combatants, two and three quarter million combatants in the Civil War. 110,100 on our side died. A quarter million would double the shot rate. A, qu a quarter million were dead by disease. I've always heard that it was twice as many by malaria and all the other ailments. And there's hundreds of thousands that were wounded but made it. So with 110,100 dead, and an awful big number of those not identified, I'm not sure anybody bothered. And it, it isn't the bother, it's just how much time can you devote to it. They are doing exactly that every time they find remains in North Vietnam or South Vietnam, that kind of thing. And I understand they're having a very high su success rate. Right. That's what, with the American Legion tradition, we have a POW missing in action flag and seat to remember that we still have, how many Horace, do you know? 1,600 still missing, I think? Right. And unaccounted for from Vietnam. There's a high number unaccounted for uh, from the Civil War, and I mean, that was crazy. There was a Zetham, forget his last name right now, Zetham, a Stockton combatant that 
was carried as a deserter and ended up with a pension. And I haven't found the whole story yet, but what tends to happen is you get into these big dust-ups and people are dying and they're wounded, but some are just missing. And the company clerk or adjutant uh, puts a guy down as a deserter and it sticks in his file for a while. Uh, when indeed he got separated from the unit and ended up with, with an outfit from New York for a time until he could get back. So there, there was horrible confusion, and they'd have to sort all that out even before they know who they're trying to do. And now you're talking, you know, if, had it been one of my great-great-grandfathers, you're talking all those generations, and you have to have the mitochondria DNA, the lady of the family DNA to do it, I, I think. It's certainly not going to get his hair follicles off a comb, like they do with some, uh, uh, some of these, uh, even with Vietnam, they're able to, uh, it's, it was recent enough that they're able to get some of the actual DNA of the individual. Another question? Comment? Pearl Harbor, they're doing it, they're doing it to all the um, veterans that were buried from Pearl Harbor. That DNA testing. That's right. Yeah. Uh, USS Oklahoma is one of the largest ones. Massive grave done at Fort Hood, uh, Fort Ford. You know the Fort burial ground. Fort Ford. Fort Ford. And they're doing that every day. I get a message for the VFW on a soldier coming home from the USS Oklahoma. Now, are you saying they're having a match every day? They're matching almost every day. Jeez. Remember the. It's a it's a big project they're doing down there. Yeah. And it was a massive grave. You know, they took the bodies and they just went Yeah. So now they're in there and they're in a place like ten times this size and they're laying out bodies and matching yeah. skeletons and getting the DNA test. Yep. So it still goes on today. They've never reached back to civil war. As far as I know right now, the fathers we've gone back is World War Two. But they have found a few bodies in Germany in World War One just a couple of years ago. Okay. In World War One. Did they go through with they the? Found the DNA. Yeah. Yep. How about Korea? Korea, How about Korea? Yeah, we just had a few bodies come home not too long ago from Korea um, because President Trump went over to North Korea and oh, Kim Il right. Jong released what 50 bodies and they brought, brought them home. So we have, mind you, the VFW goes around all over the world and does this. They're doing it into Russia everywhere. Anywhere there's a soldier that has passed away, right. they're trying to remain, recover the remains. But Civil War, I don't think so. The last one I saw was in the American Legion paper, which you just got a marker put up here they found where his body was buried. The body was removed because the Confederates lost it because they did mass burials around their, uh, their camp and they poisoned their water. <laughs> and then they moved them to another location. They're not 100% sure where. Are you hearing him? They can't determine the bodies because they're in massive graves. They do know the location of the massive one of the things that we're doing even locally, and I bet every one of these grave registration people, Steve, myself, Howard, who else? Did I hear a fourth? I think it's all, the three of us are all, Mostly. there are in Maine, right here in one room. And what we do about three weeks ago, I was at Paul Cemetery in Waldo with Hilu. And we noticed one of those flag holders, with the five stars. And so I have Find a Grave on my phone, on an app. And I, oh, okay, A. Patterson, he wasn't listed in Find a Grave. 
which means they couldn't find him in Ancestry where he was buried in Ancestry because Ancestry and even Family Search rely on find a grave. So photographed everything on that lot and went home and it took me a couple days but I researched who he was and what his military history was and the fact the 1860 census he appeared at Thomaston State Prison. <laughs> but boy, did he redeem himself. He was in four different outfits, including the first main heavy artillery, the most brutalized unit in the Civil War. Howard here, we're going to have him back someday, has a presentation on the first main heavy. I haven't heard it, but I don't care what you say about the first main. It was the most brutalized unit in the war. And he went through all of that and established a decent sized family in the town of Waldo. Two lots down, Mr. Sanborn, same thing. So we're finding the actual identified burial place of people and getting that done. And we're doing it at an amateur level. It drew me to SUVCW. If anybody here has the least bit interest, whether it's um, as an F SUVCW member or an auxiliary, see Steve. He's the man. And he'll sign you right up. And I'm shamelessly plug uh, the recruiting. We'll be doing it again on the 16th in uh, Fort Knox. Any other questions? Yes, sir. He's one of our members, by the way. Not necessarily a question, but an announcement that on July 1st, kind of everything else tied to July 1st, you had, on July 1st on your local PBS station is a video about the 16th Main at, at Gettysburg. That's, so that's on your, whatever, TV station, you get up here locally, yep. but that's on July 1st in the evening. I don't know the time, maybe 8 o'clock or something like that. But check with your local PBS station and look for that. Yep. Where was the 16th Main? Uh, what, what town does it come out of? I don't know. If, if you go online and, and look PBS, you can chase that down. Very easily. Yeah, I'm thinking it's from down east. Yep. You want to know where the regiment was from? Yes. If you go quickly to Wikipedia and I don't say that's a good place to go, <laughs> but if you go to Wikipedia and plug in the 15th Main Regiment, they'll give you a list of the battles there. Right? So it's the 16th or the 15th? 16th. 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 Yeah, and be prepared to cry <clears throat> again. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I had the ancestors in the 16th Main um, from Liberty. 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 Yep. Uh -huh. And there's quite a few surrounding towns. It's organized in Augusta. Yeah. Most, of it's, Augusta. Most of it's in this area. It says it's organized in Augusta. When they got to the 20th Main, most the, the region, these regiments were gone. They were recruiting from all over the state. So from the 20th Main <laughs> to the 32nd, those people are from all over the state. It was the 18th Maine that became the first heavy. Right. And they garrisoned Washington with these enormous guns. And General Kick em in the Butt Grant came along and said, get out and fight. Well, they had, they, Father Abraham needed more troops. And instead of taking the new ones that just enlisted, they wanted to take the ones that were got in Washington. The, First main heavy artillery, the first mass heavy artillery, and I think it was the second New York heavy artillery. They were all leave, left their tents with muskets in their hands. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I don't care what cemetery you go to in this area, you're going to find somebody uh, with the writing that they were in company whatever, first main heavy. Yeah. Uh, in Orland, I ran into two or three. All right. Uh, I need to I need to wrap it up so those that I'll get you before we do.
Those who uh, need to get up and stretch and go home can. But, <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, I, I'm a big fan of YouTube. And you can do a lot of that on YouTube also. It has a search bar. You just kind of get whatever you want to find. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm willing to bet that people, yes, will be on YouTube. And then you have a choice of when you want to watch it. Yep. The PBS has its own website where you can do the same thing. So go at it either way. Now, Brother Steve, do you need to make a proper closing? I do. I'm looking for that now. <laughs> oh, looking for the ceremonial words. I'm, uh, another thing that I would like to mention while we're, while we're here, uh, because we're just down the road from Prospect. Uh, how many people are aware that the 1st September in the year in the state of Maine, the, the, the 1st September is a holiday? Does anybody know what the holiday is?